the fact of the matter is, right, that Uncle Sam is firmly um, a, an act of propaganda, right? Um, you know, this is an image produced um, by the federal government in order to generate both um, political emotion and civic action, right? Um, and, you know, I think at, you know, you can debate the details of, of the definition of, of propaganda, but those two elements are really part of it, right? That it's coming from an official entity and that it's using emotion to generate action. Um, that said, Americans um, during the First World War and for most of our history um, have tended to imagine that we don't do propaganda, right? Um, and in fact, um, the, the U.S. government um, during the First World War established an entity called the Committee on Public Information, specifically uh, named that so that it would sound like it wasn't a propaganda agency. Um, but it was. Um, it was doing all that work um, every day. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with Pins the Podcat. You can at least see a tail. And the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 134. I guess I forgot what I was doing for a moment. And this episode is with Christopher Capitola, who is professor of history and McVicar faculty fellow at MIT, where he works on the history of citizenship, war, and the military in modern American history. And in this episode, which is the second history installment of the podcast after my episode with Jeremy Suri last week, or it might be two weeks ago, depending on when this comes out on the impossible presidency of the United States. We talk about Chris's first book, Uncle Sam Wants You, World War I and the Making of the Modern American Citizen. And because of the nature of this discussion, which you might have gotten from the title, it centers, at least at the beginning, on Uncle Sam. I highly recommend taking a look at that classic I Want You poster on Google or something, because we talk all about its background. We get into the details of Uncle Sam's get up and expression and what it represents and how the image functioned as propaganda in world war or around world war one before talking about what was happening domestically during the war more broadly and if you couldn't tell by my accent uh, i am in the united states so we talk about the draft vigilante justice uh, civil rights philosophy political philosophy uh, political obligation, and so on. And we also pay a lot of attention to meta-historical questions as we go on about facts, non-existent facts, filling in the details and the gaps, storytelling, this sort of thing. So turning off my alarm. I also have to mention, as always, that reviews, comments, likes, subscribes, please. They're great. Uh, we must appease the gods of the algorithm, as one commenter uh, put it. Thank you, commenter, who put it that way. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Chris. History was, it was always my, my worst subject in high school, and... As I think back on it, I find myself wondering if it's because I was approaching the subject wrong. So for me, studying history, as I recall, it meant memorizing facts, basically. So presidents, their parties, their platforms. And in a way where not only were they only loosely connected to one another, but they really had no connection to my life in the present. And then I contrast this with what I've gotten from speaking with historians on the show who stress to me that the work of a historian is about constructing narrative and telling stories, which is how I've come to experience history lately. And I'm wondering if that's how you see the historian's work and that's why you enjoy it so much. Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I think um, I was the, uh, I was the opposite of you in school. You know, I was actually in it for, you know, the fun of facts and dates and, um, 
And, you know, they always say the most annoying kid in the history class is the one with a, with a very good memory. Um, uh, and it's not actually about that, right? It's about sort of what we, what we do with history um, and how we turn it into stories. And uh, for me, that actually came as a, a turning point. Um, I had a job in college where I was researching for a, a travel guide, like a kind of, you know, backpacker's guide to the world. Um, and I was um, sort of exploring in what it was then uh, Eastern Germany, which had just been East Germany. And that summer, all of the museums were closed for something called historical renovation. And when I heard that, like a light bulb went on in my mind and I thought, well, okay, <laughs> now history is clearly not just about getting, you know, the facts and the names and the dates right, right? Something much bigger is at work um, and the stakes of that are very high. What is, now I'm curious, what is historical renovation? Well, uh, basically, you know, in that particular case, right, it was that the narrative in um, East German museums under the German Democratic Republic reflected uh, communist ideology. After unification um, of East and West, um, the stories needed retelling. Um, and that was a, a democratization um, moment um, uh, in in the wake of German unification. Um, but it also showed how ma malleable history was um, and how much the storyteller's perspective can matter as much as the storytelling, the story itself. So this, this malleability, this revising, does it revolve around, I guess, keeping the facts the same, but then just maybe connecting them differently and putting a different gloss on them, so to speak. That's where the, the weaving of the historian comes in. Yeah. I mean, I think um, <clears throat> the core of, of what historians do is pretty stable, right? Um, you know, we do, um, you know, sort of rely on um, sort of um, a kind of close attention to the historical record, um, however broadly we define that. Um, and, you know, we, we try to make our conclusions make sense, right, um, to anyone who reads them. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's never going to be something as rigorous as the scientific method, um, which itself is maybe not as rigorous as it purports to be, right? Um, but, you know, there is always going to be a necessity for new perspectives, which is in part asking different questions of some of the same material, right? It's why you can have a thousand books about Abraham Lincoln or a thousand books about um, the civil rights movement, um, because we're just asking new questions all the time. Hmm. Well, speaking of the scientific method, you teach history at MIT, which is thought of as the world's greatest technical college. And I imagine that many of the students in your classroom are initially at least like me rather than you, and that history wasn't their strongest subject in high school. So I'm just wondering generally what it's like teaching history to engineers and mathematicians and physicists and the like. And is there anything you have to do to engage them that would be different from teaching a cohort of history majors at a place like Chicago? That's a it's a good question and um, and a fun one. Um, so I have had the uh, the honor over the years of meeting three U.S. Supreme Court justices, and um, and every single one of them said the exact same thing. Oh, I didn't know you could major in history at MIT. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I think most people don't, don't know that. Um, but along, you know, from the very beginning, um, history has been on offer at MIT. You can major in it. Um, and when you teach history to people whose primary passions are in science, technology, and engineering, um, you, you have, some extra work to do and you have some benefits, right? The extra work is you have to kind of make a case for why it matters, right? Um, and that's something that historians have to do all the time, right? The humanities don't um, justify themselves, right? We have to kind of explain the stakes of them, um, explain why knowledge about the past, uh, knowledge about different cultures is crucial to living in the present and making a path to the future. The benefit that you get um, is that you get a room full of people with 
problem solving mentalities with uh, curiosity, with, um, you know, kind of an eagerness to look under the hood and whether that hood is a, a technical artifact or, you know, a social process often doesn't matter. Right. And so, you know, they can be just as curious about, um, you know, sort of economic change as they could be about a new, a new sort of, uh, internet technology. Yeah, you you mentioned that uh, the Supreme Court justices didn't know that you could major in history at MIT. So I'm in the philosophy department here at Stanford. And a lot of people don't realize that MIT has one of the greatest philosophy departments in the country. Uh, their philosophy, it's a joint philosophy and linguistics department. That's where people like Noam Chomsky come out of. So it's it's far from just a physics and math school. But that does make me wonder, are there... Is there a robust population of history majors? Uh, you know, um, uh, by the mere metric of history majors, right, it's pretty small. Um, but uh, but a, a significant number of MIT students take history classes. Um, you know, they have humanities distribution requirements that send them to, you know, all of the, the, the fields in humanities, arts, and social sciences. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot. And then we often get students who only, as undergraduates, only find time for the humanities and social sciences um, in their last year, right? Um, you know, after they finished other requirements. And, and to get into MIT, you have to be a pretty well-rounded student. And so, you know, they are in some ways rediscovering a love of, of other subjects um, once they kind of get their technical skills under, under their belts. Mm -hmm. But I also imagine, though, that as historians, the ones that do end up majoring in history, because they have this great technical ability, they become a unique subset of historians that have a skill that some historians aren't as strong in. Uh, yes, absolutely. Right. And and we will need more of that um, in the future as, as, for example, computational history, right, or sort of, um, you know, historical data science um, start to kind of emerge as, as new approaches. Well, one last sort of context setting question that I was curious about is, so you mentioned that you were the opposite of me and that you were very fact centric as a kid you like to memorize all of these things and i think it was in uncle sam wants you the the book that we're about to discuss that i read that you as a child had a president's look it up book so i don't know if that's exactly what it was called and your writing has largely been about american history in the 20th century i'm thinking of your book on the philippines and the United States, and then this book on political obligation in World War One. When you were a kid and going through high school and college, was American history in this period always your main interest? Um, <clears throat> no, actually, I kind of came to American history and American studies, um, you know, sort of rather uh, rather late in the game, right? And that for me. History and, and all of the humanities, um, were ways of, of exploring the world, right? Um, you know, in a, in, from the place where I grew up and I didn't, you know, I didn't grow up in a uh, family that traveled the world or, or anything like that. And so it was a chance to kind of learn about different cultures, different people, um, and also different time periods, right? So I was, I, uh, you know, tended to be more interested in places farther and farther from sort of the contemporary United States. But over time, it seemed like, you know, I wanted to use history to understand the world that, that I was living in. Hmm. It, it's neat because I haven't always been into history, but it is something that I'm very interested in right now. And I'm talking to Norman Neymark tomorrow, and I just read his world history of genocide. And genocide isn't the, the happiest topic, but... It is a way, reading that book was a way for me to get in touch with aspects of the world and cultures and people that I knew nothing about. So it was very cool. So it's it's neat that even uh, though you're a professional history, historian and I'm less than a Tyro, uh, we have the same interest and resonance. But today, we're going to talk largely about that poster of Uncle Sam saying, I want you. <laughs> Your book, as I mentioned, is called Uncle Sam Wants You. And we're going to talk about what it represents, which is much more than just a poster. 
But to start off, maybe we should just begin with the poster. <laughs> so when and where does it come from? I mean, everybody knows. I Well, my listeners are, I think the, min- the minority are American at this point, maybe like 40% or something. But still, most people are probably familiar with the Uncle Sam poster, at least from the media. Right. So I think um, <clears throat> from what I understand, um, this image, which is of, of Uncle Sam, right, uh, kind of figure of, of, you know, sort of American culture pointing out at the viewer with the words, I want you, uh, is one of the most recognizable images of the United States, not only in America, but around the world, right? And you can go to, you know, sort of any continent in the world and it will be recognized by people often used by them in cartoons and graffiti. So even if your listeners are not from the United States, this is an image that they know and, and, uh, it has a history, right? And, and, you know, I wanted to kind of start by recovering that history, but I also wanted to ask what that history might show us about America. Right. Um, and particularly America in the moment of, of World War One, which is when it was made. So <clears throat> it actually um, exists uh, in multiple forms. It actually, you know, the, the story and, and the story, I think, is is pretty accurate. Right. Um, you know, we, we'll never know for sure. Uh, is the image was drawn by an artist, James Montgomery Flagg, who was a graphic artist, um, very well known in the United States in the 1910s, um, you know, very successful illustrator. And he had a, a contract uh, to design a magazine cover for a magazine called uh, Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper, which was a sort of weekly light uh, illustrated magazine. And the, as the story goes, you know, Flag had no idea what to do. He had no ideas. Um, but so he just sort of, you know, kind of retooled um, an image that already existed. And he would have been familiar for sure with a British military recruiting poster that was first uh, produced in 1914 by the British artist Alfred Leet. Now, this poster has almost the exact same format. It has an, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, uh, individual pointing at the count, at the, at the viewer. Um, in this case, it says, your country needs you. Um, and that image circulated widely in Britain. It was definitely re, reprinted, circulated in the United States. Um, flag would have known it. Uh, basically what he did is he, um, used that and a mirror. Right. Um, and he basically took an, uh, you know, sort of a self portrait of himself, um, aged himself a little bit, um, and generated Uncle Sam. Right. And, and at first, this image appeared, um, in the, uh, in, in 1916 on the magazine cover. Right. Um, and it, uh, it was sort of, uh, you know, sort of the cover at the time said, what are you doing for preparedness? Preparedness was a kind of popular movement, a volunteer movement that advocated that the United States should get more involved in World War One, should get ready to be in the war. Right at this point, it's 1916. The war has been going on in Europe for two years. The United States is not officially part of the war. Okay, um, and then by all accounts, that you know, then the magazine article is forgotten. The magazine cover, you know, sort of drops off the face of the earth. Um, but a year later. Uh, the U.S. enters the war, right? And at that point, Flag volunteers to support the war. He, he repurposes this image into a U.S. military recruiting poster, yeah, specifically for the Army. And that's where it gets its famous caption, I want you, right? And inviting Americans to, to in that case, to join the U.S. military. Hmm. So I, I didn't realize that it was such a well-known image. I mean, it makes sense when you explain it, that it's probably up there with the American flag or George Washington, maybe even better known than George Washington. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, many foreign people think it's George Washington now that I think about it. But, uh, and I know, and I know the image too, but just a few paragraphs of the book was enough to tell me that I had never really looked at the image or thought so much about it. And when you look at it, keeping in mind that it is a piece of art made by a very successful and skilled artist. And then when you look at it from the perspective of a historian, you have to take the attitude that flag had a purpose 
and you can't really consider anything about it accidental. Everything needs to be analyzed. And one of the things that you pointed out that I had never noticed is that he is dressed in a very funny way and he, he's got very disheveled clothing. I'd never really thought much about his really silly top hat with the star on it, but even for the times, I don't think people would be dressed like that. So I wonder like what you make of how he's put together in this image and what it's supposed to represent. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as, as with any image, right, the longer you spend with it, the more, the more you see. Right. Um, and I think, um, you know, even just the details of, of his, his look, um, the look on his face, for example, right. Um, which is stern, but not, um, not quite as menacing, right? Um, and especially if you compare it to the British recruiting poster, which definitely, you know, is a much more sort of formal pose in, uh, in that case, right? And this Uncle Sam is, you know, sort of at a slight angle. And I think it really matters that his, his suit doesn't seem to quite fit the funny top hat. Now, some of that is, American visual cultural traditions, right? Um, images of Uncle Sam had uh, had existed for decades before this. Right? Oh, um, really? Okay. Yes, um, but they didn't ever quite look like this. You know, sometimes he was, um, you know, tall or short, um, usually gray haired, sometimes really quite, um, you know, sort of stocky, portly kind of uh, figure. Um, and the, but the image that Flag drew has a kind of an and, and informality. And I kind of take that as a, as a way that, that flag is conveying, um, you know, tapping almost into America's Minuteman tradition, right? Of uh, kind of, you know, that we don't have, a, at least in 19, until the 1910s, we didn't have a standing army, right? Of any size, of significant size. We had a kind of volunteer military tradition. We had a sense that um, coming out of the American Revolution that, you know, um, of a sort of scrappy underdog sort of fighters. And I think Flag is pointing to that. This is a guy who just sort of like, you know, almost rolled out of bed when he heard the alarm and, and, is, and is ready to join the fight. Yeah, I pulled up the image so that I could look at it because I haven't spent as much time with it as you have. But when I look at the picture now, I totally see that very stern face. But when I look at his face, not only does his hair kind of remind, even though it's coming out from under the hat, it kind of reminds me of like George Washington hair, something like that. But he kind of has an Andrew Jackson look to me. And I don't know how popular... Andrew Jackson was at the time, but my guess, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Here's my hunch. My hunch, because I, I just talked to Jeremy Suri about the, about the American presidency is that Andrew Jackson was, he was the first Democrat. And even though today he is certainly not popular, he had by many measures, a very successful presidency. And he represented this sort of swashbuckling frontiersman attitude that maybe people associate with the American dream. And I'm wondering if that might be at all what Flagg was trying to capture by drawing him in this way. Um, I think, yeah, that, that certainly could be, right? And, um, you know, not only, it may not be specifically Andrew Jackson, but certainly a kind of, um, you know, kind of populist, um, you know, sort of, com you know, kind of almost a community father kind of figure, right? Um, that, you know, many communities across the country would have had people who look like this Uncle Sam character, um, you know, playing crucial roles in, in local government or local affairs. And I think that flag is definitely trying to kind of put a face on this war effort. And on the other side, I think for people who are seeing this image, right, they are seeing something much more amenable to them um, than, you know, than any kind of, you know, menacing image of, of federal bureaucrats in Washington. You say that he puts a face on it. And when I say, when you say it, I'm assuming you're 
talking about the state or Washington, to use the word that you just mentioned. And it clearly worked because when you write rhetorically, you write about Uncle Sam like he's a person saying Uncle Sam wanted this or that or needed such and such. So is that am I right that that's how you conceive of Uncle Sam is what he represented, that he he wasn't just Washington, but he was he was the military. He, he he was just all these sorts of things combined in one for people. Because it, the poster says, I want you for U.S. Army nearest recruiting station. But my understanding is that the image was appropriated to all sorts of different contexts. So I want you for the, the neighborhood watch or I want you for the, the garment factory, things like this. Yeah, I mean, it could be uh, repurposed. Um, it was used particularly to sell uh, uh, Liberty bonds, um, that's a Liberty loan that raised money for the war effort, um, or you know, sort of in service of of the surveillance state as it was emerging, um, uh, asking people to keep an eye on uh, potential enemy aliens or um, or seditionists of various kind. Um, so, in that sense, he. Uncle Sam is a stand-in for for all kinds of federal power, um, and and to me, I think that's made sense to a lot of people a hundred years ago because federal power was often experienced um, in very local ways, right? Um, through individual relationships with people doing the the work of the war effort uh, in their local communities. Sometimes with you know sort of federal badges um, uh, on their lapels, and sometimes without. Hmm. Well, there there are a, a couple more things I want to talk about with Uncle Sam, and then we'll get more to the the. I know even though the book is titled Uncle Sam Wants You, it's not like Uncle Sam is just the entire focus of the book. So we'll get to political obligation. But one thing I'm very curious about is his relation to propaganda in general. So I've done very little reading about propaganda, but I know that it is a massive subject, I mean, for historians, philosophers, political theorists, artists. So it's a huge category. But what I'm wondering is how, as an historian, you think of propaganda, what it is, and and where Uncle Sam fits into this. Right. Um, So, you know, the fact of the matter is, right, that Uncle Sam is firmly um, a an act of propaganda, right? Um, you know, this is an image produced um, by the federal government in order to generate both um, political emotion and civic action, right? Um, and, you know, I think at, you know, you can debate the details of, of the definition of, of propaganda, but those two elements are really part of it, right? That it's coming from an official entity and that it's using emotion to generate action. Um, that said, Americans um, during the First World War and for most of our history um, have tended to imagine that we don't do propaganda, right? Um, and in fact, um, the, the U.S. government um, during the First World War established an entity called the Committee on Public Information, specifically uh, named that so that it would sound like it wasn't a propaganda agency, um, but it was. Um, it was doing all that work um, every day. So this Uncle Sam image uh, in its first use is designed to motivate you to re- join the U.S. Army. Um, but in it is part of a broader campaign across the U.S. government during the war um, to generate emotion and provoke action. Um, and, you know, this is a, an official government policy. Uh, it's tapping into the emerging mass media entities, right? We don't have radio yet, but there is, there's film, there's the sheet music, there's, you know, sort of po- some, um, you know, uh, popular press, there's illustrated press, there's all kinds of ways in which people are, people's emotions and, and actions are, are tapped. Hmm. One field that, I didn't mention that is also connected in various ways to propaganda or the study of propaganda, or at least because I don't actually have any experience in this, I'm assuming it does, is psychology. And so I'm wondering if you've read much about the psychology of propaganda and these sorts of images, because right now I'm thinking of this very famous psychology experiment that I'm I'm pretty sure has been replicated 
uh, and at least I really hope it's not one of the these exemplar studies that haven't been replicable in the replication crisis. But what I'm thinking of is a picture of eyes or a face or something like that is posted over some sort of donation jar. And if there's a face there, rather than say like a vase of flowers, people are much more likely to donate. And again, when I, when I look at this image, I see so many features that would make this successful propaganda. So having the eyes on you and really looking at you <laughs> menacingly in a sense, as if it's kind of like being put on the, you don't want to be put on the naughty list and having that finger pointed at you. I, I just spoke with a psychologist at Cornell, David Pizarro about social ostracism. I think that's how it should be pronounced. And it is really deep in our, so to speak, lizard brain that we do not want to be othered or singled out uh, or isolated. And when you see this, I mean, you just have the sense that everybody's looking at you. And then also one of the effects that you talk about in the book is that everybody knows that everybody else has seen this image. Everybody knows that the United States needs soldiers for World War I. So it's just very effective in all these different dimensions. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's you've hit the nail on the head, right? So part of it, and the thing I think people turn to first is the sense of, of surveillance, right? That Uncle Sam is watching, right? Um, and in many instances, when the image has been reused in the 20th century, it has to tap into that element of it, right? So, you know, sort of um, uh, critics of the of the Patriot Act, criti critics of, um, you know, sort of the, the, the FBI often will use that uh, at this image of Uncle Sam, but to convey, you know, that this is a, a menacing surveillance state who, who is watching you. And that's absolutely part of it. But I think it's important for us to imagine, um, you know, what happens on the other end of this poster, particularly in 1917, when the U.S. is entering the war. Um, and it's less about um, sort of that one-to-one -one relationship between the federal government and the person being pointed at, but the way in which all Americans are being pointed at by Uncle Sam, right? Uh, and the importance, like you just said, of knowing, knowing what everybody else knows about our obligations during wartime. Right? And that turns out, I think, to be really crucial for how the U.S. actually mobilizes for war. Hmm. Right. And you you just referenced the significance of this relationship between Washington and the people, the citizens. And that is, of course, what this image represents, this notion of political obligation and obligation to the state. And today I have the sense that most of my peers really don't feel that much of an obligation to the state. And in fact, I mean, most people I know really resent and probably despise the government for one reason or another. But was this different in the early 1900s leading up to World War One? Um, it was it was different. It wasn't completely different. Right. Um, and all the way throughout American history, um, we have actually talked as much about our obligations as citizens citizens as we have about our rights. Um, now, it is certainly the case that when most people think, um, you know, what does it mean to be American, they, um, they talk more about those rights, um, whether it is individual liberties or other kind of child, you know, political rights, um, civil rights, etc. Right. Um, but, you know, those obligations are important um, and it's obligations, you know, as simple as jury service, um, paying taxes, um, obeying the law, being loyal to the state. And those have, for many Americans, turned out to be just as important um, to what it means to be a citizen um, as as our rights. And obviously, the biggest one of those, um, at least during wartime, is the obligation of military service, right? So when this Uncle Sam poster emerges in the spring of 1917, the U.S. still has not adopted a draft 
but very soon thereafter it does. And you know that fact um, sort of crystallizes a, a nationwide conversation about the obligations of citizenship, in part because the federal government is about to impose the biggest one on one sector of the population. Hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say is that one of the crucial ways in which political obligations manifested themselves co very concretely for people in World War One was the draft. So what was and then how did people react to the Selective Service Act? And this is not necessarily the Selective Service Act, but you write that over 1.3 million men and 20,000 women volunteered for the military while even more worked toward the war effort domestically. But it's, it's so hard for me to imagine people doing that today. Uh, it is difficult to imagine uh, today, and there's certainly a, a, a bipartisan consensus um, <clears throat> against uh, sort of the, the draft. And, and frankly, also most people in the U.S. armed forces are not really interested um, in sort of a whole bunch of, um, you know, unskilled 18-year-olds who don't want to be there, um, right, especially in our high-tech uh, military forces. It just makes more sense to find people, train them, and, and retain them for longer periods of time. And, you know, in 1917, it was a different story, right? Uh, you know, this was a massive war that was going to require millions of people. And by the time the U.S. joins the war in 1917, they've learned a lot of lessons um, from the European countries that had already been fighting, that had in many ways relied on volunteer service. And in some ways, um, you know, had seen the downsides of that for a mass land war like the First World War. So <clears throat> the one thing I always try to remind people is that the draft is not just designed to get people into the army, it's also designed to keep some of them out. Right? And that's partly why it's called selective service, Right? is the idea that the government will do some selecting. Um, in this case, in particular, to ensure that factory workers, uh, farm laborers, and others don't all go off to the front lines, right? Um, and so, you know, this is part of a, a military policy, but it's also in many ways an industrial and agricultural policy as well. Um, and that's a crucial component of it um, that requires the government to, to do that kind of selecting and to get sort of individual 18-year-olds um, to, um, to feel that that it's being done fairly. Hmm. So you just mentioned the kind of people that were weeded out of the service by this selection. What were the, well, who were the 18 year olds that they were targeting? Right. So, you know, the, the overall, the army, you know, needed to go from a, a standing force of about 150,000 to they were you know initially aiming for one million and then they actually at the end had a goal closer to three million uh, men in in the armed forces uh, they never got that that big the war ended before um, we had drafted that many people uh, but they were imagining sort of something much bigger they uh, wanted to identify a few things first of all you know they needed to know um, are these individuals fit right um, and Definitions of fitness were, you know, sort of a, a little bit vague, right? Um, but for many young men, especially working class or immigrant men, had actually never been to a doctor or a dentist until the selective service sent them uh, to, to see one. Uh, so fit, you know, physical fitness was part of it. Um, they were looking also, you know, like I said, to see if this person had a job that was more valuable to the war effort um, if they stayed home and, and did it. They were also trying to figure out um, how many family members were dependent on this person, right? Um, so particularly when the draft age expands to include everyone, every man from 18 to 45, um, that's going to include people with, with families, with kids. Um, and the government didn't want to kind of inadvertently um, put a social welfare benefit burden on itself um, as it was sort of mobilizing for more. Right. So there are a lot of kind of questions about people's physical fitness, but also their jobs, their dependencies and so forth. Hmm. This is not very relevant to the purposes of our conversation. But now I'm curious, just I guess for personal reasons, why or 
how, if you know the answer, the the fitness of recruit military recruits in 1916, 17, 18 compares to the fitness of military recruits today. Do you have any idea? Uh, well, yes. Um, so um, the we we've, we've seen there have been statistics that have come through the news um, lately suggesting um, that you know many people in the 18 to 25 year old range of all genders, right, uh, might not actually pass uh, muster with the U.S. Armed Forces, right, today, um, either for uh, physical or psychological health reasons, um, sometimes um, related to past criminal records or, or other um, you know, kind of things. Um, you know, in, in the First World War, there were probably lots of other people um, who wouldn't have uh, initially passed um, the physical fitness tests. Um, you know, that, um, the, you know, people were not often not as, not as healthy, not as well fed, not as tall, right, as we are today, right? Um, uh, but the, the Army in particular very quickly decided that um, they would be able to develop soldiers and train them, you know, sort of feed them, get them healthy, and um, very quickly. Right? So they were, you know, sort of uh, not. They, you know, were obviously checking for you know people who were just not going to be able to fight. You know, questions of eyesight, um, for example, or immediate disqualifications. Um, but you know, someone who you know just was a little bit, you know, didn't have a whole lot of teeth, for example, um, could nevertheless find himself in the army pretty quickly. Uh, along with a trip to the dentist. Hmm. Well, returning to the question that I initially asked when you brought up the Selective Service Act, how did people respond in general to the draft? Uh, I would say with enormous ambivalence. Um, and that ambivalence is hard to pull out of the historical record. Right? Because there is, you know, this official endorsement coming from the government. There is this sort of propaganda machine telling people that they have to get on board. Um, but when you kind of scratch the surface a little bit and try to figure out, well, what's happening in the, an ordinary community, um, you start to see that this um, this concern, right? First, a uh, concern that this was a big departure from American traditions. Right? We had had a draft before, sort of, during the Civil War, but it was um, unpopular, um, both in the North and the South. Um, it was There was a draft evasion during the U.S. Civil War um, in both the North and the South. So there was a sense that it was not, um, you know, not part of a national tradition. There was also, um, you know, as with any of these things, a fairly um, predictable reaction, which is many people supported the draft as long as someone else's son was going, right? Um, but they could always come up with, or not always, in many cases, came up with excuses for why they should not, right? You, you know, claiming exemptions for their jobs, for dependency of their family members, et cetera. And so you know, it's worth looking at what percentage of people are claiming dependence um, or claiming exemption in particular communities. There is some outright resistance, right? Um, there's almost no sort of formal protest of the U.S. Um, uh, war policy during the war itself, right? except for a couple of scattered protests. But there is sort of resistance to the draft, right? Um, particularly in um, some rural communities, in sort of immigrant enclaves and cities, um, in Native American communities where there's a resistance to this as one of, of many federal um, sort of impositions. Um, and, you know, over time, that doesn't necessarily add up to very much, um, but it, it's, it's there and it's very real. There are also people who simply evaded the draft, um, but the easiest way not to go um, was simply not to register. Um, and that, I think, is a great window into what the American government was like a hundred years ago, right? Um, most people don't have driver's licenses because um, um, very few people can drive, right, in 1917. And um, there are no social security cards because there is no social security, right? Um, uh, 
even a birth certificate is not something that necessarily everyone has in 1917. Right? So the federal government simply cannot find all of the men between 18 and 45. And, and so the easiest way for someone who doesn't want to go um, is simply to not register. I'd like to get back to the draft dodgers and the other forms of resistance you mentioned in a few minutes. But first, something you said that really struck me, uh, a, a meta a meta uh, pronouncement you made at the beginning of your response is that ambivalence is, I think you said ambivalence is difficult to pull from the historical record. And what struck me about this is the reason that would be is that ambivalence is marked by absence. It's sort of like a negative rather than a positive feature of the historical record, something that isn't there. And I imagine that this is one place where a historian has a lot of wiggle room to work around the facts, so to speak, going back to where we would begin talking about this weaving of narrative that a, a historian always has an incomplete record of the past and the freedom that the historian has is often in working with the things that aren't there. Does that sound reasonable? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and what's not there is, is just as important um, as what is, right? Um, and partly it's figuring out, is it missing because it, there, it wasn't preserved? Right? Um, is it missing because it was never recorded? Right? And if it was never recorded, you know, why is that? Right? And of course, we've had a generation of social historians who've you know, pointed out ways in which you know, the, some people's stories are never recorded. Um, you know, in this time period, women, uh, African Americans, and other, you know, where the, the sources are, are absent um, um, or, or minimal. And, but in this case, I think what we're looking for is, is this something that someone doesn't want to document, right? They don't want to document that they're ambivalent about the draft. Or, you know, they might be trying to convince their, their husband or father to file, uh, you know, kind of a, an, an exemption claim. Uh, that's going to be done through, through conversation, through a whisper network. Through you know, I heard from so and so down the street that they got an exemption, and um, and those kinds of things, um, uh, you know, you call it wiggle room, and I think that's good. Um, you know, I think uh, it's imagination, um, but in in the best sense. So not in, in the sense that you're just making it up, right? You're using what you know about how society works, how you know people act on their interests, and how they respond to social pressure. Right. And, and the job of the historian is to kind of bear all that in mind and, and make some some educated guesses about what people might have been doing. And this is one place in which the historian's work dovetails, I suspect, with other disciplines. So especially as you get further, go further back in time, if you don't have a historical record for prehistory, for example, you have to consult with archaeologists or you have to be very familiar with the literary traditions of the time to know what people were thinking if they weren't writing them down, if there was only an oral tradition, say, something like that. Uh, this is all on my mind because I mentioned I'm talking to Norman Neymar uh, tomorrow and this is taking us a bit far afield from World War One, but he includes in his text a lot about prehistory and ancient history of genocide. And he talks about uh, genocide in biblical times and the genocide that is talked about in the Iliad. And there you really do have an absence of a legitimate historical record and you have to piece things together from other avenues. But okay, no, this is all very fascinating to me. And uh, do you have anything to say to that or should I? Yeah. No, I mean, I think it, it's, I mean, it's absolutely true. And, and part of it is about, I mean, some of it is also using the insights of other disciplines, right? You know, economics teaches us some things about how people might respond to, you know, to economic pressures um, or incentives. Sociology can help us understand, you know, how an institution is likely to work. 
right? And so, you know, historians are always borrowing from those kinds of disciplines um, along the way. Mm -hmm. And I can see why, uh, going back again to your MIT students, why having experience in these quantitative fields can be very helpful uh, for certain domains of historical research. But now, and ending that parenthesis, how were the draft dodgers, the resistors, the conscientious objectors treated by the population at large? And how many were there? And I imagine just based on the power of that Uncle Sam image that and all of the the emotions, power, uh, sort of latent anger in the figure that the reaction is pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the term, uh, at the time for a draft, dodger, I mean, they used the phrase draft dodger, but the more common term, um, used at the time was slacker, um, which is, uh, you know, sort of a great, uh, great word to describe, you know, someone who has not done his job, right? Not, not fulfilled his obligation as a citizen. And, you know, it became very clear, um, that, given the incomplete uh, nature of draft registration, right, given how hard it was to track everyone down, that there were going to be slackers. Right? And this is where I came across something you know, I had never known about um, before I wrote the book. And this uh, amazing phenomenon uh, uh, called the Slacker Raid. Um, and a volunteer organization, um, the American Protective League, um, set itself up um, as a kind of volunteer arm of, of the U.S. Department of Justice and would basically, you know, sort of go around um, and sort of track down individual draft dodgers, sometimes by actually just, um, you know, sort of doing sweeps, um, sort of, you know, massive dragnets um, in cities and towns across the country, um, basically stopping everyone who looked like a draft age man and asking to see his draft registration card. And the law did require you um, to, to, if you had to register, to, to register and to carry the card with you at all times. And so, uh, you know, starting in early 1918 and going all the way through uh, until the very last days of the war, the American Protective League is showing up at movie theaters. They're showing up in subway stations. They're showing up in uh, at baseball games. And, you know, sort of basically uh, surrounding an, an, uh, a place and inter and stopping and interrogating every man at draft age. And you know that very quickly um, sends a message, right? Um, that uh, you know that simply evading the draft by not registering was, was you know is going to be hard. Uh, um, but it also shows, I think, the crucial role of individual volunteers in doing the work of the war. Yeah, that this is something that I wanted to ask you about, because today, with the exception of isolated instances that make the news, I don't think of self-policing as being a major force in domestic law enforcement. But it seems like this was very different in the time of World War One. So just how was it different? Was there... No, I guess we don't have a national police uh, police force now. But so, what was what was the landscape like back then? Yeah, so I think it's a it's a it's a crucial part of the puzzle um, for understanding, you know, how the how the U.S. home front during World War One was was policed, and the answer is it was not always policed by police. Um, that you know, you have a, a longstanding tradition of um, of self policing and in communities, um, and you know we have memories of some of this in our language, right? The idea of a citizen's arrest, right? That empowers individuals um, to you know to arrest um, others when crimes are being committed. Um, uh, we might also think of the phrase "hue and cry," right? If you raise the hue and cry. Um, so, for example, from you know old movies, you would hear someone shout the word "stop thief," right? Um, and that would have obliged um, able-bodied men to participate in capturing that thief, right, in a community where there is not a professional police force. 
And in the 19th century into the early 20th century, uh, those traditions, those practices would have been known and familiar to people. They were being displaced um, in communities that had professional police forces. And, you know, there was an emerging modern sense that like, look, we're a urban society. Um, you know, policing is a, it's a job, it's a profession, it requires training and technology, weapons, um, you know, new things like fingerprinting and so forth. Uh, you know, so this old way of doing things was definitely on its way out. Um, but it persisted. Um, it persisted, um, you know, in those kinds of ways. It persisted, particularly when it would enforce social inequalities and um, when it enforced Jim Crow um, through sort of, you know, um, enforcing the color line through you know, bio racial violence and lynching. Um, and it never actually went away. Right. And by some measures in the 21st century, we have as much, you know, we still have plenty of community policing neighborhood watch organizations, um, uh, so-called stand your ground laws are informed by these, by the idea of, of community policing. Um, and so, you know, it certainly hasn't, hasn't gone away and in some ways has, has reemerged um, as a complement to professional police forces. Right. And not that today the, the police forces are pristine and perfect enforcers of the law, but Going into some more specifics of what you were just referencing, how did racism or prejudice against other ethnicities or classism manifest itself during World War I in these citizen police forces, for lack of a, a better way of describing them? And which groups were persecuted and why and how or when was it actually directly connected to what was going on with World War I? Yeah, it's uh, it's complicated because um, you know for for many people um, the who were not going off to Europe um, to fight in the war, um, one of the things that they felt um, that they felt obliged to do that they felt very committed to doing was to supporting the war effort at home, um, and so uh, you know basically a big chunk of sort of men over the age of, of, of 45, you know, over the draft age um, or exempt in other ways, take it upon themselves to participate in this in various forms of, of what they would have called vigilance, um, what they would have called home defense, um, you know, but that we might also call vigilantism, right? Um, and it's a very blurry line between those things over the course of the war. For some, um, the other thing that's very blurry is um, is a word that you see everywhere during the First World War, this phrase pro-German. And, and pro-German is a very slippery concept. Uh, there were, of course, a small number of people who did actually advocate um, for Germany, um, but, but very few. But more often than not, the phrase pro-German is used um, to criticize someone who seems to be standing in the way of the war effort or even just challenging the status quo. So striking workers were called pro-Germans and would have found themselves you know, sort of, uh, under the eye of these organizations. African-Americans um, who are either advocating for their rights or even simply moving away in the Great Migration to places like Chicago or New York uh, might have been called pro german and uh, uh, women suffragists, right, um, were even sort of called pro-German for challenging uh, the status quo. And that's really, you know, um, it, it's a, it gives a green light to these vigilance organizations to, um, to take things far beyond the war effort itself. Mm -hmm. And you said that those who didn't go to war felt obligated to participate in the war effort. And I was struck by this uh, as I was reading, but I suppose it's sort of a a natural response of their mascu their masculinity that this would turn violent because I imagine people felt emasculated by not being able to participate in the violence and the valor uh, abroad. And I'm wondering if there were any particularly egregious acts of violence or other hate crimes at home during the war. So I saw that one of them had to do with Liberty Loans, which you mentioned earlier, one, one instance there. 
So, frankly, um, violence is rampant um, on on the home front um, during the war in ways that um, I think would really kind of shock us. Um, and as especially as you read just newspapers every day over the course of 1918, it's uh, it's pervasive in communities all across the country. Some of it is sort of targeted at um, you know at people who are sort of not towing the line and people who are not registering for the draft, people who are challenging um, the war in some way, uh, who refuse to buy bonds, um, who criticize the war effort or criticize the federal government. Um, often, you know, those who are taking kind of left positions that this was, uh, you know, socialist positions, that this was a rich man's war, um, it was, you know, a capitalist war, you know, might find themselves, um, you know, uh, uh, intimidated, they could find themselves, you know, literally sort of dragged through the streets of town, um, sometimes um, subjected to tar and feathering, uh, hum- various instances of humiliation. Um, we know, and I don't think we'll ever have a really good count, but probably uh, at least 50 and, may- and maybe as high as 100 people are actually killed in incidents of violence during the war. The majority of those are African American. Um, so often, uh, white Americans might find themselves targeted in very public and humiliating sort of ways, made to kiss the flag, uh, sometimes even shaved, um, you know, other kinds of things that might also maybe target their masculinity. Um, African Americans um, uh, might, you know, because there is already a practice of racial violence, deadly racial violence against African Americans, or more, more frequently, um, the fatal victims of violence. Hmm. You, you, well, two things. One, I'll just start with the first one. Ta- being tarred and feathered, I think most people, if they've ever seen it happen, it's been in like a Bugs Bunny cartoon where it's kind of a playful gag. But am I right? I mean, you've read much more about this than I ever have. It's actually like a quite, it could be lethal, right? It's, it's very. Yes, it's, it's extremely, it's, a, it's extremely painful. Um, the, the tar or any other substance, I actually once encountered it being done with molasses. Um, but, um, you know, but the, that's painful. The feathering part is is humiliating, which is psychologically painful. It's traumatic. Mm-hmm. And you you mentioned earlier the this anti German sentiment that was very strong, but I'm surprised that you haven't mentioned an anti communist sentiment. So I'm wondering if the the Red Scare at all was important here, and then even to the formation of this national identity that was also happening at the same time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, um, it kind of evolves over the course of the war, right? Um, so certainly, um, there is before the first world war, there is a strong sort of socialist party in the United States, not huge, but strong. And um, there are labor movements, both, you know, kind of conservative ones and, and more radical ones. Um, and when the war comes, sort of, um, Labor activism and socialist politics are both um, sort of uh, both targeted as anti as anti war and subject to suppression. Uh, particularly when those left movements are actually challenging the war. Right. So you know the Socialist Party of America is the only socialist party in the world that actually doesn't support um, its national war effort. Right. The European Socialist Parties generally, you know, did support the, the, the war effort in their countries. Um, that changes over the course of the war, right? Um, as, uh, as the politics change, um, as the Russian Revolution emerges. And so by the time you get to the post-war Red Scare in 1919, there is a real concern that, um, you know, that uh, of, of a kind of a threat um, from, from socialist movements and communist movements. And also there is now this apparatus, the one that has been used to sort of target anti-war voices is now very easily turned uh, against uh, against anti-capitalist voices after the war. 
Returning back to how we got started on this line of conversation, we brought up the draft because it exemplified this notion of political obligation. And I'm wondering how in the abstract now, historians think of political obligation and write about it because since we've been bringing other disciplines into this as well, I mean, philosophers, they might have a more normative dimension to their work. They're thinking about uh, sh are, should people feel obligated? Are they actually obligated to the state? But I wonder if the historian's perspective is more evaluative. Did the people, in fact, feel obligated to the state? Were they compelled to act on obligations to the state? So how do historians think about it? Do you think of the average American citizen as being obligated to do certain things for the state because of what it provides? Yeah, I mean, I think this this moment, or really any moment of war, um, can be a useful point to see where sort of political history and political philosophy um, come, you know, into intersection, right? Um, and obligation is one one way of doing that. Uh, so certainly, you know, there are political philosophers um, and political theorists during World War One who are trying to figure out what are the obligations of citizens in wartime um, and who are writing about it and speaking about it. Um, I think as a historian, you know, uh, or at least for me, you know, I'm also just particularly interested in documenting what those obligations were on the ground. And at the same time, trying to recover from the historical record, um, what did people say uh, that their obligations were? You know, how did they, how did they theorize these? Right. Um, and, you know, for me, this is a very important part of the book is, um, you know, sort of a, a, is democratizing political theory, right? Um, that it's not just the preserve of the intellectuals who are writing um, during World War One, that anyone who has, who finds themselves, you know, pointed at by Uncle Sam is participating in, in, in political theory, right? Anyone who, registers for the draft, who tries to get their neighbor, you know, sort of um, caught for dodging the draft. You know, those are those are um, instantiations of, of an understanding of the relationship between mm -hmm. citizens and, and the state. Mm -hmm. And this idea of other people catching and, and telling on other people reminds me of this phrase that you use in the book that I think it would be, it would do us well to explicate. And that phrase is coercive voluntarism, which sounds paradoxical or contradictory at first, at first blush. So what do you have in mind when you write that this, well, I guess maybe there is an atmosphere of coercive voluntarism in the United States at this time? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's uh, deliberate, you know, it's deliberately a paradoxical um, phrase. Um, but I, was inspired for uh, for it from a phrase from President Woodrow Wilson, right? Who, it, when he's trying to when he's trying to sell the country on the draft, um, he says, um, you know, selective service is in no sense a conscription of the unwilling. Right? It is merely uh, a selection from a nation which has volunteered in mass. Now, you know, that is, um, you know, uh, a little bit hard to untangle, right? Because, um, you know, uh, it's definitely a conscription of the unwilling. And, but what I wanted to figure out is what does it mean to imagine a nation that has volunteered in mass? Um, how does that happen? And how is that actually enforced? Um, and for me, you know, that in, that enforcement is sort of, is part of this collective policing, right? So, you know, it's not just about mob violence in the middle of the night. It's also about, you know, rumors in the community, pressures, um, sort of, you know, um, sideways glances. Um, these have political implications for what people do um, in, in their everyday lives. And the reason, so that's, you know, how this coercion could be happening at a massive scale in the absence of, you know, any substantial federal force to, to enforce it. 
right? There are only 300 agents of what would become the FBI. The volunteerism part is that, you know, this is also a time when the federal government just doesn't have the institutions, the apparatus to carry out most of this work. They have to get people to show up and register themselves for the draft. They have to get people to, you know, to go themselves down to the bank to buy a bond. That volunteer, volunteerism, you know, whether it's knitting socks for soldiers, um, you know, all that kind of stuff is crucial to actually getting the, the job done. Um, and so it has to be enforced. And that's where the coercive part and the volunteerism part come together. Mm -hmm. The the quote that you just read, it certainly sounds like something that Uncle Sam would say as he's depicted in that image. So returning to philosophy, uh, it was interesting for me to see that philosophy made its way into your book. And particularly, I have in mind John Dewey because uh, a past guest of the show and a close friend of mine, Akile Varzi, is the the John Dewey Professor of Philosophy at Columbia. And I'm wondering how John Dewey, because I know very little political philosophy, how he conceived of World War I and then the use of force by the state to compel people to join the military. Yeah, I mean, I think Dewey, John Dewey had a, and many other American philosophers from uh, you know that moment um, found the First World War to be a real test, and that for for many of them, um, the the previous say ten or twenty years had been about sort of imagining their political philosophies of democracy in dialogue with the facts on the ground. Right, with political institutions. Um, and there's a kind of elaborate dance between uh, pragmatist philosophy um, and democratic theory of the early 20th century and the so-called progressive movement, right? People who are trying to kind of take, um, take ideas of democracy and turn them into institutions. And so some of that is being done uh, more in the philosophical and theoretical realm by people like John Dewey, some of it's being done very much in the practical realm by sort of progressives like Jane Addams um, and other reformers who are very much reading each other, like talking to each other. And then comes the war, right? Um, and it requires um, sort of them to oversimplify, right? Um, which philosophers don't do easily, right? um, you know, they find it very hard um, to, you know, to, uh, to sort of make things more, you know, less complex than they are. And um, Dewey described this as a, as an immense moral wrench. Um, and I think he captured for, for many thinkers, um, the difficulty of trying to figure out when President Woodrow Wilson says, this is a war to make the world safe for democracy. You know, for many philosophers, it's the question is, well, he might be right, uh, or that might be propaganda, right? Um, and, you know, it, it forced many thinkers to kind of to choose sides. Do we ultimately, during the war, sides with the war and, and with the war effort uh, in the hope that, you know, um, and I, I won't get the quote right, but basically, you know, that you've got to you've got to be on the elephant, um, you know, um, rather than being crushed by it. And um, you know, he had critics, and he had other uh, others at the time. The, the thinker uh, Walter Lippmann, uh, who really felt um, that you know we needed to be part thinkers needed to be part of the war effort um, in order to sort of make the war to fight the war in a democratic fashion. But, um, with uh, with expertise, and of course there were plenty of critics. Um, and Randolph Bourne is a thinker that I, I'm particularly fascinated by, who was a student of Dewey, who who called him out on it during the war and and after, um, and you know really sort of said, look, this is um, you know if you couldn't if you couldn't through your thinking stop the war, you know what makes you think that you're going to improve the way that it's fought? Right. So it's a real sort of moment of test for. Thank you all across the spectrum. 
you haven't cast judgment on any of these issues so far, at, which is fine. I, but I'm curious, though, in hindsight, do you see World War I as a war for democracy or was this propaganda to serve the state in a sense? Uh, well, you know, the, the, the easiest historian's answer is it's, it's both, right? <laughs> but it's both in, in a particular way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, the, I, I think it's, um, uh, I have no hesitation in saying the first world war is a mistake. Um, it's a, it's a terrible failure of, of leadership, of diplomacy, of negotiation. Um, and you know, it, it leads to the deaths of millions of people, um, through, uh, you know, sort of, uh, through failure of the political process. I think um, there were people who fought to rescue from it um, some things that we would call democracy, right? Um, and whether that was trying to remake the international system um, that Wilson and and many others are trying to do, um, whether it was the effort to fight the war in a more democratic fashion. Right, um, calling for example for um, for a graduated income tax, right, for corporate taxes, um, rather than you know, sort of start you know, uh, paying for the war with bonds or debt, um, for you know, in, imposing the draft in a fairer, more democratic fashion, um, or for advocates for particular groups, whether it's women, African Americans, um, immigrants, others, like who are sort of. You know, kind of pressing um, their their political claims um, with the, the power that comes from having fulfilled a political obligation. So, you know, it, it wasn't a war for democracy, and um, uh, and but there were people who were trying to make it one. Well, I'm going to ask about both dimensions of your answer, but first we'll go with the first one. And I know the subject of this conversation hasn't been the complex ideology of World War One by any stretch. And that's something that we haven't touched on at all. But is there a simple enough way of explaining why you see it as having resulted from a failure of leadership and diplomacy? Um, yeah, so briefly, um, you know, I think that the war, um, I call the war a failure um, because uh by the time you get to the 1910s, uh, the, the major powers in Europe have all committed themselves to um, a, to an arms race, um, and to an arms race that um, that is complemented by secret treaties, diplomacy um, that commits itself um, to support each other, um, and. Though that system was fundamentally anti, you know, undemocratic. In fact, anti-democratic. Um, uh, it was. It did not include the, the will of the people in any of these nations. Um, and once the the crisis of 1914 begins, it be, it is very difficult for any of the leaders of Europe to stop it. And very few of them have the the will or the imagination even to try. Um, so that's why I say it's a, it's a, a failure of the system, um, the economic system, the military rivalry system, et cetera, but also a failure of leadership in, in stopping something that many people could see coming over the course of 1914. And then in the sense that this war for democracy talk may have been propaganda, I know that this was a time in which the United States really became a dominant military global power for the first time. And today people are cynical. And even though I'm certainly not a, a contemporary historian or very well informed about the news, but people are cynical today about the wars that the United States gets into because they believe that the state or the people that compose the state stand to gain a lot of money from this or power in other ways was World War One did it serve this purpose at all for the people in power at the time? Uh, well, certainly that that argument is there from from the very beginning. 
right? Um, and there is a, a concern, particularly in the United States, right, which does not enter the war in 1914 when it begins, uh, a concern, you know, across the political spectrum um, in different, you know, or found in different places on the political spectrum, let's put it that way, um, that the war, you know, is, is, is serving the interests of some and not all. And so there is a concern, for example, um, that the United States is selling weapons like um, to Europe. Concern that the United States is lending money um, to the warring powers. And the fear that if the United States um, lends too much money to the European powers, that it will be on the hook. Right. right? Um, and that if, you know, if Britain and France lose, then the American economy would would collapse um, and that it would sort of drag us into the war through a back door. Um, and, you know, so there, there, those, those concerns were there in the First World War. They persist um, in, into the, the eve of the Second World War. And, and, you know, they, they, they still exist today, although they are sort of less commonly part of our conversations. Was there also this dimension of, military industrial contractors with close ties to government and lobbying for funds and contracts and this sort of thing already? Uh, there was, and they didn't have the term. Um, you know, uh, it's not until 1960 that Dwight Eisenhower uses the phrase military industrial complex, but, um, but people had an intuition that there was such a thing. Um, and, you know, certainly the the way in which the United States does end up mobilizing for the First World War leads to very close collaboration and cooperation between the government and private industry. And that was necessary, right, uh, in order to sort of get, get ships built, get weapons produced, get, you know, even uniforms from textile factories, right, out the door. After the war... Um, particularly during the depression, right? When, um, you know, there's more skepticism about corporate America. Um, you start to see the emergence of, of, a, of, a, of a much more articulated understanding of what we would now call the military industrial complex. And this even leads to two years of investigations by Congress, so called Nye Committee hearings that investigate the, uh, the munitions industry investigate banks, investigate other, all sorts of en entities to sort of uncover those links. And by the 1930s, of course, they're not just trying to litigate the past, they're also concerned about the future, right? And they're worried that, um, that it would happen again, that as war clouds gather in Europe, um, there's a, a, a sense that, that if the U.S. doesn't attack this, this military-industrial complex, that there will be a second world war. Okay. There is one last broad topic that I wanted to talk about before we finish today. And at the beginning of our conversation, probably towards the end of when we were talking about Uncle Sam, you brought up this dichotomy uh, or loosely alluded to what I'm calling a dichotomy of political obligation on the one hand and then rights on the other hand, and how did the concept of free speech evolve during and after the war? Because I imagine that it is quite closely tied to this idea of coercive voluntarism and that one might have been legally free to say or do certain things, but the consequences could have been uh, quite destructive. Yeah, I, the First World War is a in the United States, but also everywhere, but particularly in the United States, is a real sort of turning point for modern understandings of civil liberties. Right? Um, and, you know, we had had a First Amendment um, in the Constitution for, you know, ever since 17, you know, 1790s, right, um, that guaranteed the freedom of speech um, and of the press. But there had been very little uh, litigation of that um, and, you know, very little sense um, that of what we would understand as kind of the 20th century notion of, of 
free speech as um, you know something uh, unlimited, right? And and that are, and and there was definitely a sense that uh, responsible citizenship required balancing one's rights as a speaker with one's obligations to uh, norms of decency, um, to uh, politeness, to order, um, and when the war comes, you know those obligations turn out to matter more than the individual rights. Um, and so I was sort of struck by the way in which anti-war speech is suppressed very quickly. Um, and there are very few uh, voices in support of it. Um, and they're found in all of the pockets um, where there is also hesitation about the federal government itself. So it's found both on on the left and sort of socialist anti-war movements and, and others. Um, who um, um, and among those include the American Union Against Militarism, uh, which is a small organization that eventually evolves into what becomes the American Civil Liberties Union. It's also found in, in um, sort of more populist corners of the right um, in the United States during the First World War. Um, people who you know were using their newspapers to speak out against the draft, against uh, taxes, against bonds. Um, and who also found themselves um, often suppressed. Um, and so it's a kind of very uneasy alliance um, then, just as in many ways it is today. And the past 50 years, though, have been marked by, I think, great advances in civil rights. Do you see a lot of that as just a, maybe a natural backlash? to the coercive voluntarism around World War One, And I don't know, I, I also know a little about World War Two, but I'm assuming that with the very strong patriotism and nationalism around that time, there was a similar attitude. Yeah, I mean, I think um, historians describe... Um, describe the sort of overall arc of it as what they might call a, a rights revolution. Um, and here we're not necessarily talking about civil rights and, and kind of political participation by, for example, African Americans, but, but the rights revolution that changes our political culture such that individual liberties, um, personal freedoms, um, individual rights against the state come to play a more and more important part of how we understand who we are as Americans, right? Um, and there's no like on or off switch for the rights revolution, right? It's something that evolves over the course of the 20th century. Um, but I think a crucial moment is in the First World War when the government has laws on the books um, suppressing individual freedoms such as publication, speech, uh, assembly, uh, when the Espionage and Sedition Acts are being used against people, when these vigilance organizations are showing up at your door, and these small entities are fighting back uh, that will eventually become things like the American Civil Liberties Union, like some of the kind of religious liberty organizations, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses, who then are the sort of vanguard fighting for individual rights against the state over the course of the 20th century. So it's a it's a kind of crucial turning point. Well, Chris, thank you so much for doing this with me. I know that I had a lot of very basic questions for you when, when you could be talking to your colleagues about these things. So it was really fun for me. I hope this is the first of many podcasts on World War One. Indeed. Indeed. This is fantastic. Thanks for having me. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Earhart.